In this video, we're going to introduce vectors. So we use vectors when we want to indicate a quantity that has both a magnitude and a direction. So just to give a pretty basic example from physics, gravity is typically uh, denoted with a vector because it certainly has a magnitude. The acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. And gravity certainly pulls things toward the center of the Earth. So that's applied in a downward direction. All right, so when we write vectors, we typically denote them with letters, uh, either with a bold face type or a letter with an arrow over it. Usually when you see things typed, you see it with a bold face type. And when you see it written out, say on the board, chalkboard or on a piece of paper, since it's hard to write in bold face, you usually use an arrow over the top of it. From a geometric perspective, we use directed line segments to denote vectors. So if I have a vector v, the length of the line segment would indicate the magnitude of the vector. And then we use an arrow to help us with the direction. So the vector here would start at some point and end at some point. And so in this case, where it starts, we refer to as an initial point or the tail of the vector. The terminal point is the tip. And this arrow says that we're going from tail to tip to uh, denote how the vector's direction is going. If we are given specific points where the initial and terminal points are, so say that they are A and B, then we'll denote the vector from A to B by this, what we would typically use for a segment AB, except that instead of a just a little line segment over the top, we would have the, the, an arrow going from A to B over the top. Much like that arrow notation we talked about on the previous slide for just denoting a vector. All right. Um, in, in particular, we said that a vector has magnitude and direction. So, no, for example, with gravity, no matter where you are on Earth, you're going to denote gravity with a vector that has a length of 9.8 to represent the 9.8 meters per second squared and a direction that is straight down doesn't matter where you are on the earth, that's where that vector would always point. So that vector is equal no matter what. So if we have the same magnitude in the same direction, the vectors are equal, it does not matter what the position is. So in particular, I could slide this vector anywhere I would want, and it'll be the exact same vector. Okay. So the position doesn't have any effect. Now, if I tried to rotate it, that changes the vector because that would change the direction. Or if I tried to stretch it, that would have changed the vector because that changes its magnitude. But sliding up, down, left, right, doesn't matter. Um, one special vector that we'll deal with is the zero vector. Uh, we denote it with a zero, just bold face, or again with a line over the top, or an arrow over the top of it. It's the vector that has zero magnitude, and then it doesn't have a specific direction. Because if you have a zero magnitude, if you think about an object moving or being pulled or what have you by the vector, if it has no magnitude, it's not being pulled at all. So it doesn't have a specific direction. If it doesn't, if you're not pulled down, it's the same thing as not being pulled up. <clears throat> all right, let's talk about how we can combine vectors. And there's three basic ways that we combine vectors. Uh, the first one here is what we refer to as vector addition, one vector applied after another. So here, if I have the vector v and vector w both having the same initial point, the way we can get what the result is by adding the two vectors together would be, well, again, since it doesn't matter where we put a vector, we can slide it wherever we want, it's the same vector, I can think about moving this w and making an exact copy up here. Or likewise, I can think about moving the v and making an exact copy over here. In any event, I now have... A tr well, I can make a triangle by just connecting those two dots. Or we have a parallelogram here that's formed by V and W, and this would be the diagonal of the parallelogram. So from a vector perspective, that's how we geometrically add two vectors together. You would form a parallelogram and connect the two uh, opposite points, where one of the points is your initial, the common initial point of the two vectors. Another operation is to do a scalar. 
multiplied by a vector. Here we have our initial vector v. It was in black, but I covered it over with red to denote it uh, being multiplied by a scalar. If I have a scalar that's greater than zero, then it's going to either stretch or compress it, but in the same direction. It'll stretch it if the C is bigger than one. It'll compress it if the C is between zero and one. But if, as long as C is positive, it goes in the same direction. It just changes the length. If your C is negative, not only does the length possibly get changed, but also the direction. It'll flip the direction that we're going. So if C is less than zero, our direction gets flipped. For vector difference, much like what we do for subtraction of numbers, we really think of adding the opposite. We do the exact same thing for doing the difference of two vectors. If I want to do v minus w, I would take w and look at the opposite of w, the negative of it. So that's just a mirror image, if you will, of the exact same vector. If I want to add v and w together then, here's v, here's w. He, or excuse me, here's V and here's negative W, and here is the parallelogram formed by those two vectors. So the sum is that connecting of the dots and the diagonal. Now, this is where it's starting at the same initial position, but again, remember if we just slide a vector, it doesn't change the vector. So if I slide this up over here, this is also another geometric representation of v plus negative w or v minus w. And we notice geometrically that the difference goes between the tips of the two vectors and it points in the direction of the first vector. So we got tip to tip, but we went from v to w because we're doing v minus w. So let's do a specific example here. So the first one we have uh, v plus 3w. So notice the first thing here I did would be do the multiplication before we do the addition. So multiplying w by 3 makes it 3 times as long. So the red vector here is representing 3 times w. And then again we set up that parallelogram to get v plus 3w to be in that diagonal. For 2v minus w, we would double the length of v. And then when we do the subtraction, we go tip to tip and then point in the direction of the first vector. So we would have this vector that starts at the tip of w and ends at the tip of v. That would be a geometric representation of 2v minus w. So when we're doing things from an analytic perspective, trying to analyze what's going on with vectors, using geometry typically is more difficult. We like to use the geometry to perhaps to get a setup, but when we actually go through and do the analysis, we typically look at components of the vector. So let's start with a vector that has an initial point at the origin. Then the components are just the coordinates of the terminal point. So in two dimensions, if I have a vector that has a terminal point at AB and starts at the origin, then I would write V is equal to A comma B because that's the coordinates of the point where it ends. And then to differentiate between using the point, or sorry, talking about the point and talking about the vector, if we're talking about a vector, we'll use pointed brackets instead of parentheses around the components. Likewise, if we have a point in three-dimensional space or a vector in three-dimensional space, we have the exact same notation, just with three components rather than two. Now, if we have a vector that starts from A and ends at B, a lot of times, again, we want to do an analysis on these things. So the first thing we want to kind of do is get everything to start in the exact same place. In particular, we like our vectors to start at the origin. Because again, then the coordinates of that vector are, or excuse me, the components of that vector are just the coordinates of its terminal point. So if I have a one that starts at A1A2 and ends at B1B2, I would like to get another vector that's equivalent to it, that's equal to it, but starts at the origin. And the way we need to do that would be I need to shift B1 by A1 units. So I would subtract the A1 from the B1, likewise subtract the A2 from the B2. So to get the vector from A to B, where the initial point of that vector is the origin, 
I would do difference, difference of the first coordinates and the difference of the second coordinates. If you had three dimensions, you would also do the, dimension, uh, the difference of the third coordinates. So coordinates, again, give us a way to describe vectors analytically or maybe even think about algebraically. So we want to try to be able to figure out uh, other ways to describe these vectors as well in that same fashion. So one of the things that we might want to know is how long is the vector? What's the magnitude of the vector? So if we think about going back to the original picture here, this magnitude is the length of this segment. I see a right triangle, right? We've got a side of A here, a side of B here. So it's not hard to figure out what the distance is for that, or excuse me, for the length of that particular vector. We also talked about the difference between, uh, excuse me, the distance between points in three dimensional space in the last section. So again, we can figure out that length by just using a distance formula. So in two dimensions, if our vector is a1, a2, then the magnitude is just a1 squared plus a2 squared and take the square root. Three dimensions, it's a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared. Again, take the square root. Uh, notice here that for my for magnitude, I use double bars. Sometimes you'll see some books just use single bars for absolute value. Uh, excuse me, that looks like absolute value, but we're talking about magnitude of a vector. If you see single bars, understand that when we see a single bar around a vector, we really do mean magnitude and not just doing absolute value or something along those lines. Probably time for a specific example here. So let's say we have the points 1, 4, negative 3 and 3, negative 1, 2. And we want to figure out the vector between those two points and the magnitude of that vector that we found. So again, to find the vector between those two points, you do difference of x coordinates, difference of y coordinates, difference of z coordinates, and get the point 2, negative 5, 5. The vector 2, negative 5, 5. Now for magnitude, we would square each of the components and add them together, take the square root. 2 squared is 4, and the 5 squared is 25, so we get square root of 54, which simplifies to 3 plus the square root, excuse me, 3 times the square root of 6. We already talked about how to do addition and subtraction and scalar multiplication of vectors in geometric form. Let's talk about it doing it in analytic form. If I want a scalar times a vector, I just take that scalar and multiply by each of the components. If I want to add two vectors together, I just add their components. If I subtract two vectors, one from another, I would just subtract the two, this, each of the components. You should be able to convince yourself why these formulas are true looking at pictures. But just to save some time here to do some examples, if I want to do v plus w, again, we add the components. And so in this case, we'll get 6, negative 4, 3. If I want the two, the difference of the two vectors, I would subtract components and we'll get 8, negative 2, negative 3. If I want to do 5 times the first vector, I would take 5 times each of the components and get 35, negative 15, 0. These uh, operations on vectors lead to properties of vectors, and properties I sh should probably say better as the properties of arithmetic of vectors. So let's suppose we have three vectors, we'll call them v, w, and x, and scalars, and for our purposes, scalars here are just going to mean real numbers. Scalars can be uh, any types of n numbers that have nice algebraic properties, like they could be rational numbers, they could be complex numbers. They need to be come from what's referred to as a field, but for our purposes, for calculus, we'll talk. Well, our scalars will always be real numbers. Then we get the following properties. Well, these are nice properties that we expect from any types of uh, operations that we've been talking about with numbers, so that they hold over for vectors as well. Vector addition is commutative. Vector addition is associative. Anything added to the zero vector is itself. Anything added to its opposite gives you the zero vector. Scalar multiplication distributes over sums. Vector, this vector will also distribute over a scalar sum if it's multiplied. 
this should be a V. Oh, this is not right. This should be DV right here, not CW. It's a typo. So this part right here that I'm highlighting should be D times V, not C times W. Okay. So beware of that this is not correct. This should be D times W. I copied and pasted and forgot to change it. Here we have kind of an associative property for scalar multiplication. And here is just one times a vector is a vector. Uh, the ones that you're probably more interested in as far as per our purposes go are kind of the, that you can add in either order. You can regroup however you want. Distribution works correctly. But these properties are end up being what, properties of what's referred to as a vector space, which is important linear algebra down the road. Uh, let's see if we can prove one of these particular properties. Let's look at, say, we wanted to prove property five. So let's just give, uh, let's do it for three dimensions. Give each of the components names. If I take the C times the sum of those two vectors, well, this says I have to add and then do the multiplication. So let's add and then do the multiplication. Now inside here, these are just operations with real numbers. Okay, so I can take the C and distribute it to each individual component. All right, now I can start to break things back apart again. Notice I've got a sum of first coordinates, a sum of second coordinates, a sum of third coordinates, so I can break that out. And I can factor a C out, if you will. Look, I recognize a scalar multiple again. And then the vectors that I'm left with here are the vectors we refer, originally were referred to as V and W. So again, we put things together, used our properties of numbers to rewrite it, and then pulled things back apart again to see what we needed to get for the result. So you should be able to do the other ones as well in a similar fashion. And then one last thing here, which seems like kind of a throw in, but this particular format formatting of vectors using components, uh, rather, sorry, rather than using components, but using what's referred to as the standard basis vectors helps us do some other types of analysis for vectors. So that's why it's in this section. Uh, we refer to the vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 as the standard basis, basis vectors for three-dimensional space. Notice this talks about moving one unit in the x direction. This one's one unit in the y direction. This is one unit in the z direction. And it turns out that if we have a vector a, b, c, then I can always write that vector in terms of a, what's referred to as a linear combination of those three vectors. You would take a scalar times the first one, a scalar times the second one, a scalar times the third one. That's a linear combination. And in this case, I would need to do a, b, and c times each of the standard basis vectors. Again, there doesn't seem to be a lot of call for this right now, but again, it will be useful for us later on when we're doing some analysis of vectors.